Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a new recording, very favorably reviewed by Bob Levine on ClassicsToday.com, of Mozart's early opera, Mitradate Re di Ponto. I mean, there's a household word, huh? It's a bit of a mouthful. It's really a wonderful opera seria. And, you know, early Mozart is kind of a thing now. I mean, Mitridate has been recorded numerous times. There was the early one that was in the old Mozart edition under Leopold Hager, and it had a wonderful cast. It had it had Ileana Kotrubash and Arlene Auger and 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 Edita Grubarova and a really kind of marvelous singers. Um, it does have a castrato lead, um, the part of Fernace. Farnace, whatever his name is. But anyway, we're going to talk about this opera a little bit because it's really a beautiful, beautiful work. It's a long work. It's well, two hours, well, two and a half hours here. Not so bad because it seems like they, they trim the recitatives a little bit, which is a good thing, you know, where they just talk at each other under a little tinkly accompaniment of a harpsichord or a forte piano or something or other. But this cast is first class. It features... Um, Michael Spires as Mitridate and Julie Fuchs as as Euthanasia. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Her name is Asphyxia. Aspasia, something like that. Who cares? Um, and Sabine de Vieille, de Vieille as Ismene and Elsa Dreisig as Sifare. And Paul Antoine Benos Gian, who's a very good countertenor, actually, as Farnace and Cyril Dubois as Marzio, and Adriana Bignani Lesca as Arbate. And we have Les Musiciens du Louvre under Mark Minkowski. Now, the real competition to this one is on Decca under Christophe Rousset with, with, uh, with Cecilia Bartoli and Natalie Dessay and... Brian Asawa. I mean, it's it's really marvelous. It really is. Um, so it's you know six and one a half dozen in the other. Which one you want to pick? But the the singing is pretty pretty spectacular in both of them, and we really need to talk about the plot so you can just see what's going on. I mean, why is this a decent opera? Mozart was all of fourteen when he wrote it. But the key with with opera seria, as Handel demonstrated so eloquently is that the characters have to develop their personalities and express different emotions through a sequence of da capo arias. And da capo arias are big, long suckers in ABA form, although not all of these are da capo. Some of them, the form is starting to break down at this point in Mozart's career in 1770. I mean, we're, we're moving along toward the next phase of the operatic universe. Gluck! Is, is out there doing his thing with Orfeo and reforming. And well, you know, and of course, then there's French opera, which is a whole different kettle of beans. So, so these early opera seria of Mozart demonstrate his, his really innate genius for characterization through music, for writing wonderful vocal melody and uh, doing it pretty, pretty freely and extensively. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful work. So let's talk about the story. First of all, Ponto, or Pontus, or whatever you want to call the place. Pontus is now in Turkey. Pontus was a teeny little kingdom that for a, a short time was able to successfully oppose the conquest of Rome until Pompey got him. And when Pompey got him, Mitridate committed suicide. Yes. Uh, but this ha that has, well, it has something to do with this because... The background is the conquest of Ponto or Pontus by Roman forces, and they're all opposed to Rome. But let's let's talk about the the uh, story here, which I just love. I love reading these plot synopses. You ready? So here we go. So Mitridate is the king of Pontus, and he wants to make sure his kingdom is passing into appropriate hands. And he has two sons who hate each other. They are um, they are Farnace, who we talked about. And what's the other one's name here? Oh, yes. Sniffles. His name is Sniffles. Sifare, which translates into Sniffles. Um, they're, both, they're both sopranos. One is a 
female one is a countertenor. Mitridate is a tenor, and sort of. I mean, Michael Spires, you know, bills himself as a baritenor or something like that. And and everybody is in love with asphyxia, um, or aspasia, or aphasia, whatever her name is. Um, they all love her. But let's. But we we are getting ahead of ourselves. So let's let's see what the story is, right? Having devoted his life to fending off the armies of the Roman Empire, King Mitridate the Sixth, there were more of them, of Pontus, has been defeated in battle by Pompey, returning to the port of Nymphomania, um, no, it's it's Nymphoia, Nymphoia, to regroup, but distrusting the loyalty of his own sons, Farnace the elder and the younger Sniffles, Safare. He has allowed a rumor of his death to be disseminated by Arbate, the local governor, in order to test them. It's never a good idea. Really never a good idea. But he's going to test them. Part of his concern is due to his insecurity about his own betrothed, you know, euthanasia, um, who he suspects to be an object of interest to, no, to one or both of his offspring. And he's right to be suspicious, as it turns out. Because as Arbate welcomes Sniffles to Nymphomania, the latter learns of his brother's presence. He acknowledges that notwithstanding their father's engagement to Asphyxia, he and Farnace are indeed rivals for her affection. Arbate promises him his support. Well, whatever. Okay. Um, Asphyxia enters and asks Sniffles to defend her from his brother's amorous attentions, hinting that his own interest in her may be reciprocated. He is duly encouraged that she may return his love. Accosting Asphyxia in the Temple of Venus, Farnace renews his importunate suit. Mm, big words. Uh, Sifare intervenes, causing forensic to recognize his brother as his rival. Open conflict is prevented by Arbate's announcement that Mitridate still lives. They're not too happy about that and will shortly arrive. He warns the brothers of their father's severity and begs them to make peace with one another. Concerned for Sniffles as well as herself, Asphyxia withdraws. Farnace suggests that Safare join him in hiding from Mitridate their mutual passion for their father's betrothed. Sniffles see, aims to try to maintain loyalty to both his father and his brother. In Farnace's difficult situation, the Roman tribune Marzio encourages his boldness, promising him Rome's full support. Farnace determines to take on his father. So the plot thickens. Mitridate arrives at the port. And with Parthian princess Ismene, who is promised to Farnace. I mean, you know, you've got to have as many sort of love things as possible going on. Um, with, with Ismene in tow. When his sons greet him, the king upbraids them for their lack of support in his ongoing battle with Rome. While feigning pleasure in Mitridate's survival, Farnace ignores the criticism. Mitridate informs him that he must marry Ismene to extend the kingdom's alliances. She remains unconvinced of Farnace's love. Big surprise. Left alone with Arbate, Mitridate questions him about his son's loyalty and their feelings for asphyxia. Arbate warms him, warns him of Farnace's offer of love to asphyxia as his father's successor, while giving Sniffles a clean bill of health. Mitridate sends for the latter, his favorite, while planning to punish uh, the Rome-supporting Farnace. Farnace, whatever his name is. Okay, so that's the layout. I mean, we don't really have to get into it in much more detail. Working this mess out is, of course, how the opera how the opera goes. They all have terrific things to sing. I mean, the role of Asphyxia is amazing. It's full of coloratura stuff. And she's got a Shana at the very, very end when she decides to poison herself. I mean, she decides to poison herself. And everybody rushes in to stop her from poisoning herself because she doesn't know who to choose and she feels guilty and she's, you know, She's just a psychological mess, and they're all codependent. And so they slap the poison out of her hand, and Mitridate instead dies. He gets wounded. He dies. He dies, but he dies happy. 
because he knows that everybody at the end is united in their opposition of Rome, which is what matters. Because, you know, these opera Syria things were all designed back in the day to hopefully demonstrate to the noble audience, for the most part, what a good ruler is supposed to do and be like. Now, needless to say, most rulers in those days did not live up to the ideal that we see in works such as Mitridate. But, you know, they were trying to make the point. Anyway, this is a lovely, lovely, lovely performance. I mean, that last aria that, that, that Asphyxia sings here, you know, it's just a, Julia Fuchs. <whistles> amazing. In Act 3, I mean, everyone's got big things to do. And they do them, and they do them enormously well. If you want more detail, please read Bob Levine's review on on ClassicsToday.com, who does a, goes into the comparisons also as well with other performances of this opera. We're starting to have real competition in these early opera Syria. I mean, it used to be that there wasn't any, and you were stuck with whatever you had. But on period instruments and with really good singers and the new crop of decent countertenors who are like tolerable, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, go for it and keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.